Welcome to the 3 and 30 today. Let's go ahead and get started and others can join us, of course, as they can. Um, welcome to the 3 and 30 today. My name is Courtney Morano and I'm the interpretation manager at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And with me is my colleague, Kristen Long, who is going to be helping manage the technology. So again, welcome. Um, and today the topic that we're going to focus on is death and burial in the ancient world. So it's October. So this is a great topic um, to think about um, for spooky October. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. So what we're actually going to focus on is um, three different types of burial. So thinking about um, three types of burial that were prominent in the ancient world, of course, mummification, we can't have this conversation and not look at ancient Egypt and think about mummification. Um, but then cremation was also practiced throughout the ancient Mediterranean world. Um, and then inhumation, which is just um, whole body burial. So those are the three types we're gonna focus on. And I should clarify, we're really looking at um, cultures along the ancient Mediterranean. So Egypt, Greece, and Rome. So we're gonna start with the oldest and start with um, ancient Egypt and take a look at a mummy that VMFA has on view. So just an image of the sarcophagus at the top there, a detail of the eyes that are on the coffin, and then um, sort of a, a picture of our mummy Chebby. He does have a name that we know, um, sort of out of the coffin. Um, and there is a, a sort of netting that surrounds Chebby um, to, to help protect him. That was not an ancient netting. He was um, covered in a shroud, so covered in some sort of cloth. Um, but then our conservation department has added a sort of netting around that to make sure everything stays intact. So that's what you're seeing um, on the right side there. But I like to start these conversations and thinking about how, how a culture's belief impacts their practice. So of course, there's always a mythological or religious connection um, to, to what people do in daily life in terms of their practice, um, in this case, with respect to burial. So um, many of you might know the story of the Egyptian gods, Osiris and Isis. Um, they were king and queen on earth, the Egyptians believed, um, and Osiris had a very bro um, jealous brother named Seth who wanted to be king himself. So he, I'll just kind of cut to the chase. He threw, was a, the story's a little bit longer than this, but um, ultimately he chopped up Osiris, scattered the pieces of his bodies. Uh, body throughout the world um, and Osiris's wife Isis gathered up all of those pieces, put them back together, wrapped them in a shroud um, and that's really this idea of mummification. So Osiris became the first mummy. Um, he then became the the lord of the underworld. So that, that realm um, where the Egyptians would go to enjoy the afterlife. So he became lord of that world. And again, was the first mummy. So, so that's sort of the, the mythological story um, that relates to the actual practice of mummification. Now, of course, um, if you think about Egypt and its climate, um, it's, it's very arid, very dry, hot. There's some thought that mummification sort of began in a, in a very natural way. So if you bury a body in the sand, um, it's, it's that hot, dry sand is going to leach out a lot of the moisture and leave you sort of with, with a natural mummy. But in any case, there's also this mythological connection, but also you know, a potential sort of real life scenario that happened to bodies when they were um, buried in the, um, in the earth. And mummification, the process of mummification was, was very long. It took um, a few months to complete um, and everything was very strict um, and organized. There were um, rituals and, you know, beyond just sort of making the body dry through these chemical processes, um, there were rituals and spells and, and amulets that were applied. Um, so it was, you know, a very spiritual process um, as well as being a very technical process. So if we're looking um, at our mummy, just to kind of give you an idea of where um, Chebby was discovered and excavated, it's this area, um, it's called Sheik Farag. It was an ancient cemetery. Um, I'm actually gonna take us into the Egyptian gallery since we aren't there in person today. I, I wanted to give you an idea of what the space looks like. 
um, where our mummy is. So if we're actually heading into the Egyptian gallery and you can access these gallery views on our LEARN website, they're called gallery previews. So this is the display. If you were to walk over to our mummy Chebby, this is the display case here um, that you would see. Now, what do we know about um, Chebby, um, who he was and, and all of this? Well, we know again that he was excavated um, in the 19, uh, late 1940s, 1950s um, from this area called Sheikh Farag. And he, the mummy dates from a time of the first intermediate period um, which was in the second millennium um, BC. So his dates are around 2100 BC. Um, and it, this was a very contentious time in Egyptian history. The, the central authority of the Pharaoh had sort of broken down and Egypt was um, very much divided. So it kind of lost that unification and, and was very divided. Um, as for who Chebi is, um, we're not exactly sure, but he was probably Somebody of, of some importance, the fact that he was mummified, you know, tells us that he had a certain status. He could afford, um, you know, this traditional type of burial. Not everyone could afford it. It might be something that everyone aspired to, um, but not everybody could afford it. So we know that he was um, a man of some status. Um, if we kind of zoom in, you can see some images of the tombs where he was discovered. Down here, you can see just the entrance to a tomb. So he was put in like a rock cut tomb. His mummy was discovered in this rock cut tomb and there would have been offering. So um, another important part to that belief was that um, the afterlife was a place much like daily life where you needed all of the goods and objects and all of the things that um, you needed in daily life. So what we see here are objects that date to the same time period as Chebby that don't necessarily, they don't come from his tomb, um, but uh, sandal, wooden sandals, this is a razor for shaving um, and these pots. So again, this idea that you need things um, in the afterlife, similar to what you need um, in, in um, your daily life. So that's what it looks like in the space, but I wanna talk a little bit more about how we know what we know about Chebby. Um, so of course, hieroglyphs. Egyptians are well known for mummies and hieroglyphs um, and pyramids, of course. But the hieroglyphs tell us um, his name. Um, so we have the hieroglyphs over here that tell us his name. Um, so again, we believe that he was a nobleman. Um, the inscription sort of gives him an honorific title says the count and seal bearer um, of upper Egypt. Um, that might've been, again, it might've been an honorific title. So it may not have been a quote unquote job. Um, so we don't even exactly know what he did. Um, and the eyes here, very practical. So Chebby was placed on his left side facing east as was customary. Um, and he would be looking out of these eyes um, so that he could see the rising sun each day. Very practical there. Um, and there's, of course, prayers. I mentioned that, you know, there were prayers and the you know, very traditional formulaic types of things that were um, done when a body was mummified. And those needed to be carried out sort of in, in writing for, um, for all time as well. So there are prayers that were considered protective for the afterlife um, put actually on the outside of this coffin. So we're at, this is asking for protection of who else but Osiris, which makes sense since he's the Lord of the underworld. Um, I think I have an image of, I might have skipped that, apologies. Jump forward two slides. Um, I wanted to show you what we think Chebby looked like. This is really exciting. Um, some years ago, about five or six years ago, we had Chebby, um, he'd been x-rayed in the 1980s. Um, but with greater technology through CT scanning, we actually had his mummy um, CT scanned um, and then worked with a great forensic archaeologist who took a lot of techniques um, from, you know, from forensic science, um, true crime. I'm sure if you've ever watched a true crime show, um, you're familiar with some of the techniques that they use to um, reconstruct what somebody may have looked like based on um, the bones of their um, skull. So using different types of analysis and thinking about 
you know, potential age that the bones tell you, um, thickness of skin for that sort of demographic in that area. Um, this forensic archaeologist developed this image that you see here on the left. Um, now we don't exactly we don't know how he died. Um, you know, there's there's nothing that exactly tells us how Chebby died, but um, what we do know is based on the bones um, that he was probably about 30 years old, um, and that he. Uh, was probably about five feet eight tall, which was a good, that was a good height for um, over 4,000 years ago. Um, and so again, we don't know how he died, but we know that there was no sign of um, degenerative disease, um, you know, that he may, may have lived a fairly comfortable life again, but we, we have no knowledge of, um, of how he died. So that kind of takes us through mummification. Again, we're, we're going through a very quick journey. Um, of three different types of burial practices, but we're gonna go from Egypt to Greece. So just to show you the area that we're talking about, um, we're going mostly to Athens um, in an area called Attica. So if you're in our galleries or in any museum where you see um, a label that says Greek in parentheses, Attic, that's just referring to the area around Athens. Let's jump. So this is the object that we're going to look at. It is a Greek um, geometric style amphora. And I think you could probably guess just by looking at it why it's called geometric. Um, with the geometric shapes that you see all around the decoration here. Um, and it's also, it's not only a style, but it also refers to this general time period. The geometric is one of the time periods that we talk about or categorize Greek art into. So we're looking at the, the 9th through the 7th century BC. So we've jumped forward. Math is not my strength right now, 13, 1400 years from um, our mummy Chebby. So I wanna do another quick gallery view, just so you understand when you come into our Greek galleries, um, where you might be. So this is our Greek and Roman or ancient Mediterranean galleries. And if we kind of turn around here, I just want to give you a sense of place and also a sense of scale um, for this vase that we're going to be looking at. So it's it's over two, it's a good size. Um, it's not quite three feet, um, but it is a good size vessel. So let's talk a little bit more about what it would have been used for. So this, this object relates to cremation. Now the difference here, we don't have we don't have a body. We don't have cremated remains in this amphora. This would have been more used um, as a grave marker. So the geometric time period is, like I said, about 900 to 700 BC. This is a time when Greece was coming out of um, what gets typically called the Dark Ages. So a time when um, literacy had, had um, all but died off, um, you know, there, there wasn't sort of a, a wealthy class. It was just considered kind of a dark period um, of um, Greek art. You don't have a, we don't have a ton of artistic remains um, from this time period, but with the geometric period, we start to see art sort of reviving again. Um, and, and this is a very typical type of art um, that we see. And it represents sort of a rise of an aristocratic class. It represents a rise of, of a wealthy class who can afford to do things like this again, who can afford to have a burial marked by an object of status um, like this. So it's, a, it's an amphora. So it is, takes the form of a vase that would have been used um, in daily life. Um, so now what did the, what did the Greeks believe about, um, you know, sort of life and death? Um, it's a little complicated. We don't, we don't know um, a, a ton about their beliefs. I mean, we have, you know, we certainly have some myths and, and some aspects of their religion that we know, um, but it was mostly about practice, um, about um, in this case with this type of object, um, if somebody died during this period, it was really about um, honoring these certain rituals. So they did believe that once a person died, their psyche or their spirit sort of left the body. Um, but the, the real crux or the real importance was the way that you handled all of that after their death. 
So the family and the friends um, were really responsible for, for ensuring that this person had proper rights associated. So once somebody died, um, there was just a very prescribed set of rituals that people had to follow. And that had to do with once they died, there was a sort of anointing and washing of the body. There was a period of time where people would come and visit the body, which, you know, quite honestly in America existed into the 19th century. If we think about parlors in, um, in homes, I mean, those were places where the body would sort of lay in state. So I mean, that's very common in, you know, in other cultures as well, as foreign as that might seem to us today or to many of us today. Um, and then there would be a procession. So once that time period was over, which would be very quick, I mean, this, this wasn't a, you know, usually a three day process. There would be a procession um, to the grave. The body would be cremated. Um, and then the body wouldn't have necessarily been placed in an um, amphora like this. Again, this was a grave marker. So the body would be cremated put in, in another type of vessel and this vessel, and this would stand um, as the grave marker. And the fam I mean, the family had a lot of responsibilities to continue um, to um, make offerings, to continue to sort of be the thing that reminded, um, you know, people about this person. And so their memory sort of lived on through the family and the remembrances um, and these offerings. Now the scene that we see on here, is a little more complicated than just the, the um, geometric decoration. So if you can see, there are horses and those are chariots. I know they're a little, a little washed out, but those probably indicate um, possibly military, something military. There was a connection between funerary games and military practice. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person buried was a soldier. Um, it could be that it's the procession that leads to um, the, the grave, very typical on these amphora and other types of vessels that marked a burial spot. You would find actual, um, the actual parts of the funeral process. So it could be that this is part of the, um, of the funeral process. So in this case, sometimes what you see on a vase very specifically relates to um, its purpose and its function, which is not always the case um, with, uh, with Greek vases. Kristen, any questions that I should answer before? Oh, perfect, perfect, perfect time. time. I, I was just gonna pop in, I was just, just waiting for a second. So yes, we did, we've had a few questions regarding um, the first object, uh, someone asked, were the coffins made from a particular type of wood? Is the coffin painted? And did the conservators leave the original shroud and add the wrapping? Any questions? So yes, um, Egypt is not known for um, great forests. Obviously, it's you know it's a desert. So um, let me jump back again. Um, so we understand this one is made of acacia wood, um, which which is a type of tree that grows in Egypt. Um, but not in, not in great quantity and also not, we're not talking huge trees. So there are parts, if you're looking in the gallery, you can see it a little bit better. Um, there are actual pegs. So where smaller pieces of wood were put together. So they would have taken this, the, in this case, local wood um, and it would have sort of pegged it together to make this. So a lot of times sarcophagi in Egypt are going to be made of stone, which they had way more access to. Um, so does that mean that this was elite? You know, was this something special during that time? You know, and it could be. Um, and, you know, others would have been made of other types of materials, cartonnage, which is like a kind of a plaster um, material. Um, and yes, this would have been painted. So the hieroglyphs on here um, are actually painted. Um, and I believe the entire outside of the coffin at least has some sort of layer of, of something on it. Was there another part to that question that I miss? Uh, yeah, then um, it was also asked, um, did the conservators leave the original shroud and add the wrapping? That is a great question. Yes, so the original shroud, which is one reason it has this. So essentially what you're seeing is the original shroud, but it is covered by a very thin, um, almost like netting. And that is to to make sure that that shroud, that we don't lose any pieces of that shroud, because you can imagine after 4,000 years, that shroud is very fragile. So there is um, this thin netting type covering um, that conservation added. Yes, great mm -hmm. question. 
Okay, and there was a, also an additional uh, question, which I'm not sure if it referred to the first object or the second, or maybe overall, but it was asking, um, would grave markers be at a cemetery or were people buried at home? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for asking that. Um, so in the case of, um, well, cemetery, so definitely Chevy come, our mummy comes from a cemetery. So there would have been um, very large cemeteries. Um, you know, th there's gonna be cemeteries for the elite. There's gonna be cemeteries for, um, you know, sort of the, the everyday people like us. Um, in the case of, uh, Attica or the case around Greece where this base was um, was made um, there was an entire production area um, it's really connected to the productions of these pots um, and then where the burial sit the burial places are it's really interesting so there's an area right outside of or right in Athens and outside of Athens called the Karamikos which comes from the Greek word for clay um, but so this is where the potters um, were producing these types of vases. And then just on the other side of the city wall um, was uh, one of the main cemeteries. So where lots of people were buried, um, it was very, you did not want to bury the dead within the city walls. It was considered polluting. So there was a very clear marker between um, you know, where you were supposed to be buried and the sort of the interior of the city. Now there's exceptions to that. So that is, that is just kind of a general rule. Um, but for the most part, you don't want to have anyone buried inside the city. Again, there are exceptions to that. Um, especially like I know more in ancient Rome, I mean, the emperors had, you know, very special clout and they would often be buried, you know, inside the city and in grand mausolea, um, and stuff, but yes, great question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to leave um, Greece and, and thinking about um, cremation and, and kind of move on to um, inhumation and move on to the Roman Empire. And there's a, there's a lot of similarities, you know, with beliefs um, in Greece and, and even in Egypt, you know, thinking about um, cycles and, and offerings being given. Um, and I think the other thing to mention, particularly with Greece and Rome, um, and even with Egypt, I mean, these were, well, they're all polytheistic civilizations. So they're all civilizations that worship um, more than one god and goddess. Um, and there's not, there's not a um, specific um, religious text that everyone ascribed to. Now, there's similarities. You might have gods and goddesses that you um, you worship in common, um, but often, you know, you were sort of dedicated to, to one god or goddess more than the other, again, particularly in Greece and Rome, and even in Egypt. I mean, there wasn't a Bible or a Torah or a Quran um, that sort of told you um, the way in which you should act and behave. Again, there's common sets of practices, but what becomes more and more popular, um, you know, throughout these times is this idea that you know, if, if you follow one god or goddess, um, there, may be, there may be secret rites, there may be secret initiations, and there may be promises made within those. So in ancient Greece, um, something called the Eleusinian Mysteries, you could be sort of indoctrinated into that cult. Um, and, and the thing is, they're secret. So, you know, a lot of people ask, like, why don't we know more exactly about their um, practices and their beliefs, and, you know, in some cases it's um, in secret, and sometimes it's also that it, it's easier for an outsider sometimes to observe and, and question the things that are just part of um, part of your culture. So I would say, I wish we could send an anthropologist back to ancient um, Egypt, Greece, and Rome, and, and figure more of these things out. Um, but we are moving on to the Roman Empire, just a map of um, how large the empire was because the object that we're gonna look at comes from this area of the Roman empire, or at least was made in this area of the empire. And I sometimes say made versus was found because we don't exactly have the provenance on all of these objects um, to know, you know where they were excavated. You know, some we do, some we don't, but um, from some of the clues we know, we can tell where this was made. And Courtney, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Just, just to ask, somebody had a question about the vase, the last object. 
and asked, is the vase without a bottom? It says, uh, I assume the ashes were placed in the amphora, the libations would draw the ashes into the ground. Um, that is a great question. We don't believe that this one held the ashes. So we think this one was just a grave marker. Um, but you are indeed correct that sometimes vases that were um, left um, you know, at, as grave markers um, would have had libations poured into them. So sometimes you find um, there's another style of vessel called um, lekithoi, like, and they, they are often large and they're very funerary in context and they will have holes in the bottom so that um, libations can be poured in and kind of go back to the earth. Um, to be honest, I don't know that this one has a hole in the bottom. That's just something I don't know, but um, we believe this would have been more of a grave marker versus have held the um, cremated ashes. Okay, and then um, just another question when we were speaking about God, someone had asked, was one God more praised than the others or were they praised about the same? That's a great question. I mean, you have, you know, in ancient Greece and um, the Roman Empire, I mean, you have sort of the 12 Olympian gods. I mean, so you have that. That's one thing that sort of can be looked at as, as a unifying force. I mean, you have, you know, Zeus and Hera and um, Aphrodite and Artemis. And so, you know, these 12 gods and goddesses that were sort of the most, most popular, if we're going to say that. But um, you know, and there were festivals, so many festivals um, that they had uh, that were dedicated to um, the gods and goddesses. So, I mean, I think in a sense, there were ones that, you know, everybody sort of took part in, um, but there did become a time where you might be more, um, you might have a certain god that you uh, sort of preferred to worship, and, and that was okay. So, I mentioned the um, Eleusinian Mysteries. It has a lot to do with um, Persephone um, and that story about Demeter and Persephone. Um, so you might you might sort of be indoctrinated into that cult, but that doesn't mean that you for forewent belief of all of the others. So it's sort of like yes and no, and it was very, also very regional. So I mean, if you think about from this image, how large you know the Roman Empire was, and particularly, um, I mean, you have people from different areas of the Roman gods. They were really great about assimilating gods and goddesses from other areas. So, so there was a regional bend to that as well. Hope that helps. All right, so in our last couple of minutes, we're gonna look at this sarcophagus. Um, and I mentioned it's called, I mentioned it came from the area of the Roman empire that we, at the time was called um, Asia or Asia Minor. So from an area that um, present day Turkey. So this is it, just take a gallery view. So you kind of see where it is. Unfortunately, this gallery view does not go all the way around um, the sarcophagi, but I want to kind of give you an idea of um, how big it is. It's very large, very heavy, um, made of marble. Um, and so you can see it from our window down in the atrium, which is great. Um, but again, just like with the Greeks, I mean, the, the Romans, and, and it differs throughout time. So I'm, I'm making some generalities. Um, you know, there was, there was this idea that there was, there was something, there was, you know, something that happened after death. Sometimes it was not always considered a great place. Like the Greek, the Greek underworld was not really a place you wanted to be. And that changed, that changed over time. I mean, you know, we're talking about thousands of years of history. So pe people's belief um, sort of changed over time. Again, in, in ancient Rome, you have the same type of thing happening. You have people who were um, believing in different types of cults. And some of those may have been a little bit more focused on, on a life after death or a promise of redemption. Um, so again, it's, we can talk in generalities, but sometimes we need to be specific with what's being represented. Um, so this is a sarcophagus that dates to the third century um, AD. So we've, we've jumped about 900 years in the future from our Greek amphora. Um, and this, a, a whole body would have been put here. So this would have been, um, I know a full body would have been put here. So the Romans practiced um, cremation. The Greeks did too. Um, the Greeks, as you know, practiced cremation, but they also practiced um, whole body burial and had sarcophagi. They sort of used them interchangeably, sort of one came in and out of fashion throughout the time, but it wouldn't have been unusual that they would have practiced both. Um, the Romans really earlier on in their history preferred cremation. 
it wasn't until the second century AD that they started to prefer um, inhumation or, or whole body burial. So then you get this real rise in Roman sarcophagi. Um, and this one we call Asiatic, not only from where it's from, but it's also indicative of a style. You can see all four sides are carved. Um, so that's just something that's typical with that. And that has to, again, do with this fact the Romans did not bury their dead inside the city walls. They buried them outside the city walls, you know, just like the Greeks. So um, you would find um, the streets lined with um, tombs, which um, is really interesting. And I'll show you a picture in a minute. But what, but what is on here and how, what does this have to do with belief? Um, what we have represented on here are um, arotes or little arrows figures, cupids, um, puti sometimes they're called. The Renaissance um, era really loved these kind of angelic um, figures, but they're very mischievous. They're related to Eros, the god of love, and they're always, they're always getting up to something. They're always doing something a little naughty or pretending to be somebody else. Um, so what we have really on all four sides is um, these erotes pretending to do something, uh, pretending to be other people. So we think in this case, they're play acting. There might be the four seasons. We've got some fruit, some, you know, some garlands. This might be a figure represented as Pan, the sort of god of the forest um, and the hero or later god Hercules with his club. Um, so they seem to be also involved in a procession maybe, but again, they're sort of, um, they're play acting, they're personifying these other characters, um, but also maybe involved in a Dion, Dionysian procession. So they, they're associated also with um, the god Dionysus, who you might know more as the god of wine um, or Bacchus. He's also the god of revelry, partying from the wine probably. Um, but also he does become associated associated with, with death in some context because um, the story surrounding his birth and death, um, there's, there's sort of a um, story about rebirth. He's sort of reborn again. So um, he's sometimes called the thrice born just because of his myths, which I won't go into a lot of detail here. But um, in terms of the scenes on sarcophagi and their connection to belief, um, there's a lot of, I would say a lot of different theories about that. You know, were these were these scenes related to somebody's belief about seasons being representative of um, sort of life and death and rebirth? And that's possible. What is it also possible that these are just popular scenes throughout Roman um, mythology and in Roman sort of cultural and artistic life? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, kind of the unfortunate answer is, you know, there's a lot of theories um, and we just don't know. And it also could have been highly individualistic. So, you know, what, what one person thought and chose for their sarcophagi, you know, there may have been a very different reason that somebody else um, chose the same type of scene um, and put it on their sarcophagi. So it's, you know, the, 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 the scenes are not always connected um, with this idea of, um, of religion and a deeper life. Could have just been a scene that they liked. Um, I think the interesting thing too, is that these were made, there's a lot of um, production in these. Um, they were made often half carved and shipped off. And there's really a market for these. So, it could be shipped from Asia Minor over to Rome, the city, and finished by other arts craftspeople there. So, I mean, again, there was this market and the patron could often choose um, what they wanted. And I just wanted to show this. This is a, another type of Asiatic sarcophagi. It's a fairly well-known one. It's in the Istanbul Museum, so-called Alexander Mosaic. It represents scenes of Alexander the Great. We don't think he was buried in this. Um, but this is the type of top that would have been on our sarcophagus. So they would have had a full gabled lit, um, lid to it. So imagine how heavy, heavy that would be. We have lost the lid, we have lost the body, um, but just wanted to show you an example of that. Um, I also like to remind people that these would have been brightly painted. So the way that we see them today with these, um, you know, just as white marble um, is very much not the way that they would have looked in antiquity. Um, and just, just an example of what those streets outside of a city lined with some of these tombs 
um, could have looked like. This is the um, Herculaneum Gate right outside the city of Pompeii. So this is kind of what you can still see on the left. And there's just a, I like this artist rendering of what it might have looked like um, back in the day. So imagine walking sort of into these city gates and this is where you have all of these monuments. Again, a lot of what we have is really dedicated to the elite. Um, so it's not necessarily the everyday burial that would have would have probably happened um, elsewhere and in specialized places for um, for them. But I'm going to wrap it up. It looks like we might have some questions. Just a quick trip through Egypt, Greece, Rome, and different burial practices. So thank you. We do have a few questions. Do you want me to ask them, or do you want to read them yourself? I cannot pull them up for some reason. Though. Okay. Do you mind, Chris? No, not at all. So a few questions. Um, so one uh, was, how did Romans prepare the body of, excuse me, body for burial? That's a great question. Um, similar to the way that the Greeks would have, I mean, there would have been, um, their funeral process is a little bit longer, um, but there would have been, you know, this period of, um, usually women were the ones that would sort of wash and anoint the body, get wrapped in a shroud. Um, and then there would be the viewing, right? So where family and friends could come view the body in the house and there were very prescribed ways um, to do that. Um, and again, there would have been the sort of procession to the place. Um, there would have been speeches made, um, but there, yeah, I mean, beyond sort of the anointing and, and the wrapping, um, you know, either eyes, you know, eyes would have been closed. Um, I mean, sometimes you hear about coins being placed, um, but there wasn't, you know, a process as elaborate to the body um, as mummification. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we uh, had a couple of questions. Uh, sorry, one, had, uh, this was in relation to the amphora, again, about positioning um, was, or, uh, excuse me, with the amphora, do they just sit on the ground? Could you find them in elevated positions or did they just primarily stay on the ground? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I don't 100% know the answer. So they, they're often associated with um, tombs, so tomb mounds, so sort of mounds of dirt um, where you might have the, the cremated remains and these would stand sort of you know, outside or near the cremated remains. Um, I think in the case of the ones that had the hole cut in them, I think the importance was that they go to the earth. Um, but I don't think that there was a kind of a prescribed formula to say it has to be this or it has to be that. So there, there certainly is variation, I would say. Okay, and then uh, the last question, and I think this is in reference to the sarcophagi. It asks, um, were they made for kings or quote unquote important people or just, every, you know, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you can see, I, I kind of liken it to mummification, right? Like this is probably something many people aspire to is to have something like this. Um, I think this one is an example of some, someone who would have been an elite, certainly the emperors um, at the time when they weren't being cremated would have had very elaborate um, you know, sarcophagi. I mean, we have more evidence of some of their tombs prior uh, to, to full body burial um, with where cremated remains would have been mausoleums and things like that. But yes, these, this type was definitely more of an elite thing. Um, so your, your, what we would call lower classes um, would probably not have buried, been buried this way. I mean, there's even cemeteries where there's sort of um, group, group graves or um, in the case of cremation, if you couldn't afford a, um, a kind of a fancy tomb, there were things called columbaria. It's like a group, like a group mausoleum with niches, niches for um, cremated remains. Um, but people also paid in. I mean, there was actually a very complicated funerary structure. Um, there were funerary colleges which is not a college in the same way we think about it, but um, a group where you, you would sort of pay into it. So you could sort of pay into, maybe it's like a savings account where you're kind of paying into this, this group that would help with your funerary um, arrangements, but also you're paying for the cost. So there was kind of a, I don't know, it's like a payment plan in the future. <laughs> kind of makes me think of, but. Yeah, just a comment. This was really fascinating and enjoyable. Thank you, Courtney and Kristen.
Well, thank you all. So nice to have everyone. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.